I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from the front lines, analyse the continuing strikes on Ukrainian ports in the region southwest of Odessa, and we hear from our senior foreign correspondent, Roland Oliphant, who's on the ground in Ukraine. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 7th of September, one year and 196 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant, and assistant comment editor Francis Sterling. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Hi David, hi everybody. So let's start over in the east of the country, in the, um, in the town of Kostyantinivka. Uh, At least 17 people killed, over 30 injured yesterday from that Russian strike. It was just, it was happening around 2 p.m. local time. So just before we went on air, but we hadn't seen the news yesterday. Russian shelling, artillery shelling of a busy marketplace. This is about 15k southwest of Bakhmut here. Uh, We think it's probably the deadliest attack on civilians in months. Although it's a grim, it's a grim fact that you have to sort of, Stretch your brain to try and work out if it is. Anyway, it was a a very large explosion that ripped through the open air market yesterday, as I say, just after 2 p.m. local time. There's footage of it on social media. We've got it on our website as well. President Zelensky said later on Telegram, a regular market, shops, a pharmacy, people who did nothing wrong, many wounded. Uh, He said the strike was a terrorist act and speaking later in a press conference said it reflected... Uh, on the battlefield, the situation on the battlefield. And this is something we've seen quite a lot. He said, whenever there are any positive advances by Ukrainian defence forces, Russians always target civilian people and civilian objects. When someone in the world still attempts to deal with anything Russian, it means turning a blind eye to this reality, the audacity of evil, the brazenness of wickedness, utter inhumanity. So, as I said, just a reminder... Recent Russian attacks on civilian areas have included, but are not limited to, June's strike on the pizza restaurant, you'll remember, in neighbouring Kramatorsk. That killed 13, injured, uh, wounded 61. And then last month, a double-tap missile strike on the hotel restaurant complex that was frequented by journalists, aid workers, the uh, UN in Pokrovsk. That's 30 k's further southwest. Nine people killed in that attack, at least 88 wounded. Now, further afield, drone attacks in Russia. Ukrainian drones have been blamed for targeting three Russian cities in uh, attacks early this morning, overnight early this morning. Three buildings damaged and one person injured in the city of Rostov-on-Don. You remember that's where, well, it's, it's the one of the drones exploded close to Russia's military southern headquarters. Um, that was where, you remember Prigozhin when he did the whole Wagner thing, all mutiny, no bounty. He went there, and uh, that was where he was filmed before they started charging north. That came from that that news. There, that's confirmed by the TASS news agency, Russian news agency. Then in Bryansk, so further to the northwest, but still inside Russia, two two drones just two drones destroyed by air defence. We think, but debris um, damaged uh, damaged buildings and a railway station and cars and what have you. And that's from Interfax news agency. And then separately, Russia's defense ministry said they shot down a drone over the outskirts of Moscow. Then sticking with drones, but moving into Ukraine, several drones hit a number of buildings in Enohoda. That's the, the town in the kind of center of the, the country on the river. That's home to the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Now, it's currently in the Russian controlled part of Ukraine's southern Zaporizhia region. And this news comes from the Russian appointed governor there. So we're not entirely sure exactly what's happening. Then move further to the southwest, stay inside inside Ukraine, and then drones, Russian drones attacked the Danube River port of Esmail again, the fourth time in five days. More damage to grain silos and other infrastructure. Be, I mean, Russia are silent on what this is about. How is this anything other than an attack on uh, uh, the fe- you know, feeding the world? But hey, let's hear what they have to say, which is silence. Um, now, that attack lasted three hours early this morning. This comes from Odessa... The regional governor there, Oleg Keeper, he said on on uh, on Telegram, 
And separately, the Ukrainian Air Force said that um, 33 Russian drones in a number of different waves overnight uh, were well, were launched at Ukraine, 25 shot down. Now, you'll remember, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about this later, but Ismail, it lies on the river, the Danube River, and the other side of the river is Romania, a NATO member. It's one of the main, if not the main, export route for um, for Ukrainian products, in particular grain, since, uh, since Russia backed out of the grain deal. Sticking with grain, we've got, uh, so Romanian President Klaus Johannes has said that the Russian attacks on the Danube River ports is, is going to slow down the export of grains and other routes need to be enhanced. You know. uh, he was speaking last night at a summit of the Three Seas Initiative in Bucharest and he said, of course, the attacks on Ukrainian ports on the Danube were a huge problem. Of course, it it will, in a way, slow down exports. We will enhance the other routes. We accept Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian maritime transport through our Romanian territorial waters of the Black Sea. We will continue to enhance exports on the rail and on the road. Now, Romania's Black Sea port of Constanta is Ukraine's largest alternative export route. Um, grains are going out uh, or to there by road, rail and, and barge from the Danube in a bid to keep the uh, keep the export going. And then just something we mentioned uh, yesterday or the day before, talking about Russia redeploying forces. We don't think they've got anything of any great strength in terms of a reserve. They might be able to launch local counterattacks, or very small counterattacks, but we don't think they've got an operational reserve. And basically, if you think about Ukraine at the moment, in operational terms, we'd say there's um, something in the northeast, something in the southeast, and something in the south. Those are the kind of three operational areas. So to, to have an operational reserve is is to have forces of that size that can stop a either a major breakthrough in one of those areas or affect a huge advance yourself. So we don't think Russia has got anything in the way of operational reserves. And we think they are thinning out forces from the central bits around Bakhmut to, to fill in down south where this where Ukraine are having the most success. So Colonel Mikhailo Ulyashevich, who is a Ukrainian military spokesman, he said this, which we think was happening anyway, but he said... Um, by regrouping forces from other areas and using reserves, Russia is reinforcing units engaged in defensive actions in the Berdyansk and Melitopol sectors. Um, he also reiterated their thoughts that, that they are between the first and the second line of main fortifications down south. That view was echoed by NATO. So NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, he said that Ukraine is making progress and he said the Ukrainians are gradually gaining ground. They have been able to breach the defensive lines of the Russian forces and they are moving forward. He was speaking this morning in the uh, in the European Parliament. And I'll, uh, I'll pause there, David. Well, thanks very much for that overview, Dom. Dom, you spoke about these strikes on Ukrainian ports in the West. Roland Oliphant, you've been spending more time there and have written up and filmed a dispatch for the Telegraph. What more can you tell us about the atmosphere on the ground? What what did you see in here? Hello, David. Yeah, so we um we went down to his mail the other day and we spent an afternoon speaking to local people. So the situation is, to give you a kind of geographical sense, there's this little bit of Ukraine that kind of sticks out to the southwest of Odessa. It's quite remote from the rest of the country. It's an area called Bessarabia. It's a lot of fascinating history that I'll, I'll try to whisk over. Anyway, the point is there is a, there is one quite narrow road that goes down from Odessa all the way to the border, which is on a branch of the Danube River. So the Danube Delta there, the Danube divides into several branches. On one branch, there is the border. And as Dom mentioned, since, well, since the grain deal collapsed in July, it's become extremely important. But actually, since the beginning of the war, this has been one of the main export routes, not only for Russia, for Ukrainian grain, but pretty much any kind of good. So that whole road is clogged with grain lorries, fuel tankers, any other kind of articulated truck you can imagine. They're all going down to these three river ports that Ukraine has there. There, the cargo is loaded onto barges. The barges go upriver and then around and down and across the canal. And by that point, they're inside Romania. They come to the port of Constanza. Then it's reloaded onto seagoing ships. And that's the main route now for grain to get out. Now, the grain deal, uh, which, which 
as we remember, brokered by the United Nations and Turkey. And the idea was that Ukrainian ships carrying foodstuffs would still be allowed to set out from Ukraine's Black Sea ports, places like Odessa. Russia walked out of that in July, saying it wasn't fair, that there were still restrictions on Russia's own exports. And that put an end to that. Um, And the Russians, almost as soon as that happened, began hitting all of the infrastructure associated with that export. So since first strikes, I was told by locals, happened at the port of Rennie on the 25th of July. Since then, relentlessly, drone attacks, usually Shahed uh, kamikaze drones, hitting specifically port infrastructure, grain silos, anything like that. It's all about the export infrastructure down there. It's been a very sustained campaign. If you go down there, you can kind of see damage around the place. The Ukrainians are quite sensitive about it. They don't want to talk too much about it. And it's quite difficult to gauge just how bad the damage is. But but speaking to some local people there, we spoke to members of the uh, the local Rotary Club in Ismail, who are quite active pillars of the community. They were saying, you know, it's it's been, it, it feels relentless. And it has been a uh, nighttime down there. They're always waiting to hear the drones um, coming in. And of course, as Dom mentioned, I think it was on uh, early hours of Monday morning, people there saw this drone crash uh, in Romania across the river. Very much for that, Roland. Roland, you've been on the road again. You're, you're now up um, at the other side of the country. Um, is there anything you can tell us about what you've seen in, on your travels so far? Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of tarmac, um, to be honest. We came up to Kiev yesterday. I mean, the, mo- the most interesting thing I think that I can tell you about is about that day we spent far down on the border. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating little area. So it's a really long way from any of the ground fighting. It's an area that was completely, talking to locals, they say completely untouched by the war for basically 18 months. So no bombing, no no bombing. Obviously, the ground, the land war is, is a very long way away. It was overlooked. But that road it used to take about two and a half hours to drive in peacetime, two and a half hours between Ismail and, and Odessa. It's now, you know, it took us about five, five and a half hours, I think, just because of the congestion. This absolutely huge just i don't know how, how to describe it i mean it's like a it's a bottleneck right you can you can feel the bottleneck you can feel the huge burden of freight that is trying to go through this through this border you could it, it is incredibly tangible just how important this connection is how it's clearly overburdened and therefore how how vulnerable it is to these russian attacks really elsewhere i mean I, I think I spoke to you about Odessa, where people are still swimming in the beaches. There's a beach where they've got a boom out, so you can swim without any mines coming in. Still a fairly relaxed place down there. And Kiev is functioning functioning in the same way that I think it has, it has got used to functioning since the battle here ended in spring last year. So, you know, you want, you want to be, you, know, you don't want to say, oh, everything's fine, everything's normal, everything's functioning, it's normal, because everybody's under pressure, everybody's everybody's tired but nonetheless a you know a a fairly busy functioning capital city really thanks very much roland we'll come back to you later maybe i mean you mentioned some of the fascinating history of Bessarabia, so it'd be good to have some time to go over that Uh, but for now let's go to francis durnley for the latest strategic and political updates Well, thank you, David. We were eagerly anticipating yesterday more details of what the $1 billion donation from the United States to Ukraine would be constituted of. And this morning we do have more details. It does make for interesting reading. So the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who's still in Kyiv for his visit, has announced that the assistance includes $175 million for air defence system components. I imagine that's preparing for winter. Missiles for HIMARS systems, of course, vital for the strategic advances Ukraine is seeking to make at the moment, small arms, ammunition, shells and communication systems, 100 million to meet long term military needs, 90.5 million towards humanitarian assistance for mine clearance. Again, no surprises there. 300 million in support of the efforts of law enforcement agencies to restore and maintain law and order in liberated territories. 206 million for humanitarian assistance, including food, water and shelter for internally displaced persons in Ukraine, as well as refugees abroad. And finally, 203 million to be used in support of transparency and accountability of institutions, strengthening key reforms related to the fight against corruption and the investigation of war crimes committed by Russia. 
I think it would be hard to find a better summary of what the core priorities for Ukraine are, minus, of course, the aircraft support. We want to make sure that Ukraine has what it needs, Blinken said, not only to succeed in the counteroffensive, but has what it needs for the long term to make sure that it has a strong deterrent. He was standing alongside Ukraine's Foreign Minister Kuleba. He said, we're also determined to continue to work with our partners as they build and rebuild a strong economy, a strong democracy. Now, perhaps most interesting is that Blinken also announced as part of this that for the first time, the US is transferring to Ukraine assets seized from sanctioned Russian oligarchs, which will be used to support Ukrainian military veterans. He put it bluntly, those who have enabled Putin's war of aggression should pay for it. This apparently concerns a very specific $5.4 million to be directed to the support of said veterans. Nevertheless, it sets a precedent, one that may give the green light to other countries to follow suit. And unsurprisingly and tellingly, Moscow is not too happy about this. They're already kicking up a fuss, saying that any plan to send Ukraine funds seized from Russian business people targeted by sanctions is illegal and will be contested. And remember, the Kremlin knows the importance of keeping such individuals on side. Hence, I think, their angry reaction today. Now, staying with the US, Kamala Harris, the US Vice President, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and Chinese Premier Li Xiang are attending an East Asia summit in Indonesia today in a rare opportunity for direct high-level diplomacy between the rivals. The 18 Nations Summit is the first time that top US and Russian officials have sat down around the same table in almost two months after US and European officials condemned Mr Lavrov at a July ministerial meeting over the invasion of Ukraine. Ms Harris and Mr Lee attend, will, uh, will hold and attend separate talks with Southeastern Asian leaders in the next few hours where the US Vice President yesterday discussed the importance of upholding international law in the South China Sea. See. Now, that, I think, probably comes off the back of the new map that China released, which lay claim to large portions of the South China Sea, which I discussed last week in detail. It's a very interesting. The timing was interesting, but also the contents of said map. Now, we're proud on this podcast to pay a closer attention to Central Asia than most, a region covered, of course, by James Kilner. And in that vein, it's interesting to see that Armenia will host joint drills with US forces next week, the latest sign of the former Soviet Republic's drift from its traditional ally, Russia, something that, as we've discussed at length in the past, seems to be a consequence of the war in Ukraine and Russia's alleged failures there. The announcement came a day after Moscow dismissed criticism from Armenia that Russian peacekeepers were failing to maintain order over the only route linking Armenia to the breakaway separatist region of Nagorno-Karabakh in Azerbaijan. The Armenian Defence Ministry said that the Eagle Partner 2023 drills aim to increase the level of interoperability between Armenian and US forces in international peacekeeping missions. They'll be held from September the 11th to the 20th in Armenia's Tsar Training Centre. The Kremlin has responded, saying the announcement raises concerns and vowed to thoroughly analyse the exercises. No doubt James can talk about this in more detail soon. Just a couple more stories that caught my eye. According to the British Ministry of Defence's daily intelligence briefing, residents of the Russian-controlled area of Donetsk Oblast are now receiving Russian language local news bulletins from one of Russia's major broadcast organisations. It says on the 4th of September, the All Russia State Television and Radio Broadcasting Company opened a Donetsk franchise and commenced broadcasting in the internationally unrecognised Donetsk People's Republic. Local news bulletins are provided by the One TV channel and present the Russian view of the war. This is part of Russia's broader effort to assert enduring control over the area. After the invasion, pan-Ukraine providers continued to provide locally sourced Russian language content. Dinjonetsk has taken a year for Russia to achieve what it has now sought to is now achieved, having first been announced in 2022. This was almost certainly due to the refusal to work of trained local technicians. Those sympathetic to the DPR and with the required skills have now likely been brought in from Crimea, Luhansk and elsewhere. 
The statement goes on. Although blocked over the airwaves, Ukrainian broadcasting is still accessible to a wide audience via the Internet. Where Russian filtering restrictions are in force, audiences use VPN or other active circumnavigation technologies. If we have any listeners in the territory, suffice to say, who want to reach out to us on this, please do so. And lastly, Don Rowland have already talked about the issue of grain shipments. And just one more thing on this. As we've talked about in previous episodes, one of the major impediment for, impediments for exporters is getting insurance for making what is obviously a dangerous trip in any circumstance, given the military situation. And Ukraine has reported that it is starting exporting grain via Croatian seaports, aiming to broaden its export routes while its black seaports are blocked. But in a sign that perhaps conversations taking place behind the scenes are making progress after the scarting gun was fired with Erdogan and Putin's meeting last week, Lloyds of London is in talks with the UN over providing insurance cover for Ukrainian grain shipments if a new Black Sea corridor deal can be reached. So Lloyds CEO John Neal has said today, are we happy and able to continue to provide insurances in the event that a corridor can be reoperated and can be reestablished? The answer to that is yes, Neil told Reuters. We are in active discussions with the UN about how that might happen and how it needs to be structured differently as to how it was before. It does seem, therefore, that progress is being made in those conversations over the restoration of the Crane deal. But the question is, what is the nature of that deal being discussed and what might Russia get out of it? More on that as we have it. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Let's go back and talk about this Russian drone that caused this dispute or this disagreement between Ukraine and Romania over exactly where pieces of it had landed. Dom Nichols, you've been having some thoughts on this. Can you talk us through them? Yeah, so just as a as a recap, the, from the strike, I forget which night it was now. It wasn't last night. Maybe it was, I think it may have been Tuesday night. There was a, there was a suggestion that one of the missiles that Russia had fired at the port of Ismail on the river Danube and actually either been shot down or just overshot the target and landed in Romania, just the other side, a couple of hundred metres away across the river in Romania, obviously a NATO country. Now, that was disputed. I think I think the official line at the moment f- from NATO is that, that it did not happen, although there are there's a lot of um, anecdotal evidence to, and photos of, of missile parts, allegedly missile parts and what have you from Romania. But anyway, it, 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 it almost doesn't matter. I mean, of course it matters in the big scheme of things if this is Russia attacking NATO it's not Russia attacking NATO it's Russia being stupidly slapdash again about their targeting and being so cavalier as to decide it's worth the risk by firing Ismail worth the risk of of something happening inside Romania and therefore NATO so part that for one moment but I think what the more they do this the more justification there is for Romania and NATO to say, right, this is a big old concern. We've got these missiles coming over in this this little part of our geography. We better stick some air defence in there. Now, I don't know if Romania's got Patriot or any what their system of air defence is, but let's suggest that NATO then say, wow, this is a, this is a big old risk. Let's stick some Premier League, Patriot or other air defence systems just near the river, just protecting NATO territory. We're not we're not having to go at anyone in, uh, you know, we're not having to go at you, Russia. This is not escalatory, but it's just to protect NATO territory. Now, if that bubble of air defence happens to extend across the river and into Ukraine and over the port of Ismail, well, that's just a, that's just a, that's just physics, right? That's just the bubble. That's where the air defence can go. And let's say a missile, cruise missile from Russia is heading in that direction. Well, how does NATO know that it's not going to overshoot and land in Romania again? So they might be, just to be on the safe side, just to be on the safe side, lads, let's shoot it down. Now, if afterwards Russia comes out with all sorts of ballistic trajectories and say, no, no, it was going to land in the port. It was going to hit Ukraine. It was going to land in the port. You had no right to blow up our missile. You know, NATO can say, well, sorry, stop chucking these things around and then we won't have to launch our our highly sophisticated air defence assets at it. I've heard that argument, maybe not put in such glib terms, but there we go, it's Thursday. I've heard that argument around the bazaars and I think the more that Ismail is hit and certainly the more that stuff allegedly lands in Romania or certainly is proven to land in Romania and God forbid we have like that incident that we saw in Poland last year where people are killed in, in they were killed in Poland you remember those um, those uh, farm workers then I think NATO is entirely 
within its rights to say, look, just we need to do that. We need to redeploy assets. This is not provocative. This is a, a necessary and proportionate step taken to a threat against our borders. And if there's a happy coincidence that it protects his mouth, so be it. I, I'm waiting for that to happen. And I, I think very cautiously that um, things seem to be edging in that direction. Well, thank you very much, Dom. Roland, can we go back to you? You mentioned in your first piece today about this sort of interesting history of Bessarabia, of this area. And you're completely right. I mean, looking at Google Maps now, we've not talked almost at all about this area of Ukraine until the last few weeks, until the missile started landing. So it's a bit of a, it's something, you know, we, we here don't know much about either. What do you think listeners should understand and know about this particular very southerly region of Ukraine? Mm, it's interesting. I'm um, just on the on on what Dom was was mentioning, and I it, it was quite interesting talk just to, on the Romania thing. Romania is only about uh, I, I couldn't measure the the river there, but it's it's not very wide by Danube terms. I mean, maybe less than a kilometer across there. There were plenty of people in Ismail who I spoke to who, well, <laughs> saw <laughs> the missile uh, the, the the drone crash. There are people who filmed it. I was quite close to speaking to some, but they shied away because you're not meant to be filming during an air raid for um for security purposes. They didn't want to get in trouble. But you know, you, you asked people about okay, so there's something landed from on the Romanian side. So yeah, yeah over that, and someone, my friend, was standing on her balcony there and pointing that direction. So it happened. And they were quite bemused by the Romanian reaction, which was initially to say, to basically categorically deny that this had happened. And then to say, well, not to deny that it happened, but to just emphasize that Ukraine's, uh, sorry, sorry, Romania's uh, security and territorial integrity was not threatened by whatever had happened. And then finally, last night, the defense minister finally says, oh, we found some fragments exactly where everybody on the Ukrainian side of the river had been saying it had fallen. Oh, we found some fragments. And then finally, President Johannes says, well, you know, I've ordered an urgent investigation into this. So it was for the people I spoke to in Ismail on the Ukrainian side of the river a couple of days ago, the, the, which was before Romania had admitted it had happened, that reaction was quite bemusing. They didn't quite get it. In fact, some of them claimed to me that two drones landed. They didn't have any evidence of that. And another person said to me, well, you know, we, we've, I mean, between you and me, you know, we, we've heard stuff vaguely from that direction before. It might not be the first time. Now, I, I absolutely, they could not provide any evidence or proof that it had happened before, but they suspected it had. And the, the reaction from Romania, I think, from their point of view, when Romania basically denied the Ukrainian announcement that this had happened, was, I suppose, disappointing, really, because you would expect a NATO country to be much more assertive about protecting its territory and its airspace, even though it did land in that part of the river is basically woodland. There wasn't any real danger of hitting a hitting a populated area. And it, it seemed, I think, from the Ukrainian side to look like, you know, Romania was really, really trying to back down and not trying to avoid actually doing anything assertive, if you see what I mean. So I'd be, I'd be quite interested in where that debate, that, that idea that Dom has just suggested would go because at the moment the impression i was getting or people read down there were getting was that well for some reason our neighbors really don't want to acknowledge that happened and their guess about what happened by the way was that the the drone had been hit by probably hit by ukrainian anti-aircraft fire and came off course and crashed down there and it was on just to clarify early hours of monday morning that it happened and so those are my thoughts on the romanian thing on Bessarabia. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. So Bessarabia, the historical Bessarabia is basically the land between the Dniester River and a tributary of the of the Danube called the Prat, I think. Anyway, basically, it's modern day Moldova, but the lower bit of it that faces the sea, about a quarter of it, that is Ukrainian territory. And the history is is fascinating. Ismail, I think, was originally a Genoese fort in kind of the 12th, 11th century, something like that. It eventually became a, an Ottoman Turkish outpost, a very important fortress on, on their frontier when they ruled what is now Romania and Moldova. And then as the Russian Empire was expanding in the 18th century, you know, with their succession of wars against the Turks, especially in the late 18th century, when they expanded into what is now southern Ukraine, they captured it. There was a particularly famous battle in 1790 when the, the Russian general Alexander Suvorov stormed his male fortress. Lord Byron wrote about it. It was a, a great event. It wasn't that kind of ended the war, that particular war, 
But later, the Russians came back and annexed it. And the kind of interesting thing is, for today, number one is that, according to the people I spoke to who live there, they said, look, like, we've probably got about 40 nationalities living in the region. And Ukrainians are actually only a very, one of about 40 and not the biggest. There's Albanians, Romanians, Moldovans. There's a very old Bulgarian population who still speak um, their own version of Bulgarian in the villages. It's apparently, so I'm told, it sounds slightly archaic to modern Bulgarian speakers from modern Bulgaria. So that's fascinating. Russian is still the lingua franca because, you know, it was for a long time part of the Russian Empire and and that was the, the lingua franca that united all of these peoples. And And really interestingly is that even now, the personality of Alexander Suvorov kind of dominates Ismail. Even you know the main street is Suvorov Street. The oldest building in town is this this mosque, fourteenth or fifteenth century, which was is kind of the only remaining part of the fortress that he stormed. It's not functioning as a mosque. The Soviets put a diorama of the battle inside it, so it looks like a, a beautiful bit of architecture from Istanbul. You know, pay your forty gulden, you go inside, and there is a huge diorama of Russian soldiers and Cossacks storming this fortress, and it emphasizes Suvorov's role. And it's 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 fascinating how this guy's a, a you know a Russian imperial hero. Right now, he is not flavored with the month for obvious reasons. So they've taken down his statue, and the city authorities are thinking about what to do about it. And, and one woman who we were talking to there, we visited this exhibition, and when we came out after listening to the recorded audio guide and said oh did i mention suvorov i said yes yeah. she goes yeah well he's just like all the rest of them isn't he and so ba- basically her point of view was like this guy who for for a long time has dominated the history of our town we now look at him the same way we'd look at vladimir putin sergey shogu gerasimov surovikin i mean basically as uh, a russian war criminal who came here and slaughtered people in order to to extend an empire so it was a it was a fascinating kind of encounter with multiple multiple layers of history there, and at the same time, it's also I must say an incredibly it's a very pleasant place. I mean, the air battle that's been going on there, and they've had I think they had another raid last night. That was the last night's raid was the fourth in five nights. In the day, it still feels like a kind of relaxed, sleepy, very clean place. Wide streets going down to the Danube. There's still kind of teenagers swimming in the river, ignoring the please do not swim here signs. And I spoke to, you know, I was kind of quite attracted by the idea of dip myself. And then the guy showing us around said, I wouldn't. I said, well, is it, is it mind? No, but we are at the bottom of the Danube and all of Europe's effluent is in there. Um, he said, so you're probably going to get sick. But yeah, fascinating, fascinating part of the world. Really interesting landscape as well. It's 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 delta, it's, it's low lying, it's reeds, it's marshes. The Kurgans, the old burial mounds, they really stand out in that landscape. And, you know, a lot of kind of nature reserves and spots that, that that tourists kind of like. And it was actually, you know, a lot of refugees, I was told, initially headed down there and stayed because it felt so safe and peaceful. Well, thank you very much, Roland. I didn't know what we needed today was a uh, positive history of the culture and uh, uh, and everything of Bessarabia, but I'm very glad we got it. Thank you so much, Roland, for that. Um, Francis, is there anything you want to add before we move to our final thoughts? Thanks, David. I really enjoyed that as well. It was really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to comment on one thing that Roland said, which was talking about the Ukrainians' understandable frustration at what they see as a, a lack of frustration coming from Romania. And I, I think that's absolutely correct, although it is worth saying that they are at least commenting on these strikes, whether they be from drones or from missiles, at the Three Seas Initiative Summit meeting in Bucharest, which uh, Dom mentioned, which is, by the way, a gathering of 12 EU states, mainly former Soviet in Eastern and Central Europe, which is itself, I think, quite interesting and telling in the current context. At that, the Romanian defence minister said that if it is confirmed that elements come from a Russian drone, such a situation would be completely inadmissible and a serious violation of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Romania, a NATO allied state. So they are talking about it, but it's one thing talking and very different to then act in a more robust way in some of the ways that we've discussed today. 
A NATO spokesman, Dylan White, has also said in a statement that NATO allies express strong solidarity with Romania and will continue to monitor the situation closely and remain in close contact with our ally, Romania. Now, I know all of this sounds, you know, like the usual pleasantries that we get, and all of this may feel a little bit like a, a non story, but we focus on it because, as we saw with the stray missile that hit Poland last year, if something major were to occur and a missile were to strike a settlement in Romania or even a drone, then suddenly the whole world would know about it. It would be front page news. And so understanding the context is really important. And I will continue to look at it um, for that very reason. Well, thank you very much, Francis. Let's move to our final thoughts then. Uh, Dom Nichols, why don't you go first? Right. Well, so firstly, thanks to everyone for the, your messages after yesterday's pod. It's lovely to know you're you're there and uh, and helping us out when we need it. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm off tomorrow, off ski, off ski, off uh, the pod and off on a jet plane. I'm leaving on a jet, literally leaving on a jet plane. Going to the States tomorrow, the start of our um, uh, tour next week. So, yeah, over the weekend, I'm, we're, I'm not going to speak to you again until Monday, David and, and folks, uh, but over the weekend I'm going to be chatting to some old friends at the Boulder Crest Foundation. That's a, a charity helping military veterans and other fir- and first responders, plus all their families. Um, they help them through and after and thrive after trauma. So I'm going to speak to them over the weekend. I'm going to be up in the Appalachian Trail. I've already asked if I can expense bear repellent as office uh, expenses to which the managing editor here at the Telegraph just sort of blinked at me and, and, and shuffled off thinking something had gone terribly wrong in the Defence Department. Uh, but I'm going to be up on the Appalachian Trail for a couple of days, then going over to Colorado, seeing some friends of the pod who are I can see uh, in the room now, and you know who you are, uh, and then off to the US Air Force Academy. That will be, so we're coming live from, I'll be coming live from the US Air Force Academy Monday morning i've been very they very generously invited me to their 9-11 commemoration as a former serviceman i i thought that was a very generous gesture so i'll be there i'll but i'll speak to you zero six hundred from colorado <gasps> on monday and then yeah they're not off we go again and you guys join us so cheerio folks i'll see you on the other side of the pond well safe travels dom and best of luck getting everything you want expensed expensed francis don't they Thanks, David. It's also my last time on the pod before the US. I'm not travelling tomorrow, though. I'm travelling over the weekend. Very much looking forward to that. And I've also got a very busy itinerary, which we'll talk you through early in the week, next week. But uh, it's me standing in for Dom on our video series Defence in Depth this week. And I decided to do a deep dive into Putin's top three lies from the Second World War to modern Ukraine. It was a very long list to choose from, suffice to say. I won't spoil what the three are, but the video seeks to condense with all the fancy graphics they throw in there and things like that. Some of the false narratives that the Kremlin peddles, which we've discussed on the podcast these past few months. For years, Russia has distorted its history, contorted it so profoundly that we, just like millions of ordinary Russians, can no longer measure modern Russia according to the most important metric, reality. And I just wanted to look at that more deeply and discuss the implications of it. It will be out by seven o'clock London time, which I think is about two o'clock Eastern on the Telegraph's YouTube channel. And we'll be sure to add a link to the description of this episode. So do check that out and look forward to hearing people's comments in due course. Well, thank you, Dom and Francis Rowland. Do you want us us to bring us back down to earth and crucially back to Ukraine? Uh, What are your final words? (laughs) I suppose, actually... I think Francis made a good point about this drone incident in Romania, which is when you remember the missile incident in Poland last year or whenever that was, there was a lot of a lot of excitement and assumptions that uh, Russia had, had, had deliberately fired a missile at Poland. Of course, it turned out to be a Ukrainian air defense missile or its remnants that had fallen on the other side of the border. So I think there is quite right to be relatively cautious about you know, reports of this kind of thing happening. And I was certainly relatively cautious remembering that when um, when I headed down to the river the other day. I mean, I spoke to enough people. Um, I, you know, I'm pretty confident that it is, as the Ukrainians said, and that the drone did land, or, you know, in Romania or native territory, but quite right to be fairly, not to jump to conclusions, which is true of everything in this war, to be honest. I mean, I will be, you know, we'll be in country for another week or so, and we'll be moving around and trying to 
see things, which is really the job to to observe and report what we see. But as I often, I suppose it might maybe an excuse, but as I often say and remind people, like quite often what I see is going to be less informative than almost anything. It's very difficult to actually understand big picture stuff, what is going on when you're on the ground. And it often pays to, to be quite conservative with a small C in terms of your your assumptions or your conclusions about what you're seeing. If that's not too non-committal, a final thought, uh, that's what I will be attempting to do as I um, I drive around the country and try and try and report on the war over the next week or so. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.